So I, I wanted to share a concern with you this morning. It's a concern about a battle, a hidden battle that is uh, waging and that I don't think is working out uh, optimally for humanity. Uh, but because I never like to present a concern without a solution, I would also like to uh, share with you what I think is the way we can cause this battle to start taking shape in a way that is better for humanity. So it's a battle for the soul of innovation in the 21st century. And the battle started, was started by an unlikely source. There. Aristotle, imagine that. In fourth century BC, Aristotle did something very important, very impactful for the world, but actually set up uh, something that's, I think, not working out great for the world. So Aristotle, as many of you in the, in the room would, would know, was really the father of science. And he wrote this book, Analytica Posteriora, Although for sticklers, he actually didn't write that as a book. He wrote a whole bunch of stuff and it was compiled into a book in the first century BC that laid out for the first time in human history the rudiments of science. What is cause and effect and how do you conduct scientific explorations of the world? It was a really important uh, book. Uh, there are some other folks, a bunch of DWMs in, uh, uh, in the Age of Enlightenment who are credited with creating the scientific uh, method. Galileo, Newton, Descartes, Bacon, depending on who you, which, which uh, scientist, philosopher you particularly, uh, particularly like. But I would argue that it was, in fact, Aristotle that laid down the rudiments of that, that these, these gentlemen, these incredibly clever gentlemen, formalized. And because after the formalization of the scientific method and the industrial revolution that, that ensued, uh, world economic growth took off like a rocket, there was a huge inflection point, uh, the world, unsurprisingly, fell in love with science. And science, as we know, has pervaded field after field after field. My own field, which is the field of business and business uh, education, has moved in a, in a highly scientific direction, especially in the last uh, 50 years, actually, uh, was, was when, that, uh, when that really uh, turned. But, and, and as we know in business, those of you uh, who uh, hang around business literature, what is the absolutely coolest thing now in business? The biggest trend, the hottest topic? Big data, data analytics, that's it. That's everything. We got it. We got it. We got to analyze everything because data analytics is what the world is is all about. But if we go back to Aristotle, since he kind of invented all of this stuff, started the whole thing, it's important to understand kind of what Aristotle said about science. I would argue, and what he said about science is the unqualified purpose of science is to demonstrate that things cannot be other than they are. So notionally, if I were to drop this clicker a thousand times, everywhere in the world it would accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared, except America, of course, where it would accelerate at 32 feet per second squared because <laughs> America is exceptional, as we all know. So that's a part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. And that is the purpose of, uh, of science. Just as much as Analytica Posteriora is perhaps the most famous and impactful book on science ever written in the history of humanity, and anybody who's a student of science, a history of science, history of philosophy will have, will have uh, read it and absorbed it. He also wrote a book called Rhetoric, which is as unread as Analytica Posteriora is read. And in this book, Aristotle pointed out the following. He said, you know, there's and I'm paraphrasing a little here, there are two parts of the world. One part of the world is the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. Right? That's this part of the world. Right? 
gravity. It just is, and it can't be otherwise. And the purpose of science, and my first book, laid out a met methodology for understanding that. When we don't understand the way that works, we use science to essentially help us understand as fully as we can the causes of the effect that we see. That's that game. Right? He said, so that's, that's that. But he said, there's another part of the world where things can be other than they are. And here's the kicker. He said, in that part of the world, please do not use analytic a posteriori. It doesn't work. It's inappropriate. It was not designed for that part of the world. Don't, 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 don't use it. And what, what is that part of the world? Well, that's the part of the world that this gentleman inhabited, right? It's the part of the world where we all live a whole bunch of our lives. The part of the world where humans become the cause of a new effect. Right? So we didn't think we wanted to pay 2x for a little white thing, wheelie thing with, uh, with a little wheel on it that played songs. But then we did. Right? But Aristotle would say was, there is no way science can help us with that. And in fact, the scientific method doesn't work for that and is actually destructive to that effort in the part of the world where things can be other than they are. So in much of the world, I would argue in much of the modern world, we are listening to the world's greatest scientist and not listening to him simultaneously. We are applying the method designed for the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are to the part of the world where things can be other than they are. And if you apply the techniques for the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are to the part of the world where things can be other than they are, you will create a self-fulfilling prophecy where the part of the world where things can be other than they are starts to look like the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. Because what do you have to do in that world, in the, in the scientific world? You have to have some logic to which you apply data to analyze what is, right? That's what Aristotle said, right? The purpose of science, the unqualified purpose of science is to demonstrate that things cannot be other than they are. So you use data to demonstrate that things cannot be other than they are. Right? I maybe ask a little simple question about data. In what era of the world does all data come from? What era? The past, right? Where's the data about the future? It's not there yet. It doesn't exist yet. There's only data about the past. So why is the scientific method good for the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are? Well, you got all sorts of data, and all that data points to something that cannot be other than it is. So you actually don't need any data about the future, right? There's no, there's no need for that because you're staring at part of the world where things cannot be other than they are, so you just analyze the data and declare things to be the way they are and say, here, we now understand this. We understand this medical thing. We understand why when people smoke cigarettes, they get lung cancer. We got it. But if perchance the world can be other than it is, every piece of data that you crunch will attempt to convince you that the world cannot be other than it is because that's the very nature of the scientific uh, process. 
So as we've decided that science is cool, analysis is cool, data analytics is awesome, what we're doing is crushing innovation. This is why when I give talks on innovation, and I've, I've, I'm tired of this so I've stopped doing it, but I always would ask the question hundreds of times, uh, who in this audience would describe themselves as, as satisfied with the pace and level of innovation in their organization? And the modal answer is zero. Right? Over 50% of the time, nobody raises their hand. And the, the maximum answer is about 5%. I just do a rough count. About 5%. Right? There's a reason, a really good reason, why we're frustrated with the pace and level of innovation. It's because we use a technique that is designed to destroy innovation in a huge part of the world. The part of the world where things cannot be other than, uh, the, the part of the world where things can be other than they are. So for me, the thing we've got to do is recognize that there are two parts of the world. And rather than letting this be a clash, so I think the modern clash that we're experiencing now is a clash between analytic posteriori and rhetoric. That was the name of his second book. Originally, what rhetoric meant is the dialogue between people that, uh, that helps us come to a conclusion. Now it's considered sort of empty argumentation, but that was the original thought. It's analytic a posteriori versus rhetoric is the modern clash, and in my view, rhetoric is being demolished, and demolished especially in large entities, large organizations, large corporations, large not-for-profits, large government, are all having a huge, huge uh, uh, task with innovation and are, are being frustrated uh, by innovation. Where is innovation coming from mainly? Children in garages. And those children in garages, fortunately, don't know any better and are winning. What I think the answer has to be for the world is we need analytic posteriori and rhetoric. I am not making an argument that the world should be a rhetoric only world. I make an argument that we need both and it's situational. Right? It's situational. So where do we use analytic posteriori? We use it for the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. Then we can use the scientific method. So you must ask yourself every time you analyze something, every time you bring data to bear on a question, literally, I'm telling you, any time you ever bring data to bear and analyze in a scientific, scientific fashion, you must ask yourself the question, am I looking at a part of the world where I am sure things cannot be other than they are, in which case, knock yourself out. Right? But if I'm looking at a part of the world where I imagine it can be different, and in fact, I want to create something different, like a new product, a new service that customers would love but don't have now, Data and data analytics and data analysis and being scientific is not going to help you. It is going to impede your progress. And the way it'll impede your progress, it'll convince you that you are looking at a part of the world where things cannot be other than they are and you won't do anything. So it's splitting up the world into those two pieces that is absolutely essential. How? How we go about doing it if we're in the analytic posterior world? Right? We analyze in order to determine the causes of the observed effect, which is, of course, where much medical research comes. Right? The cool thing about medical research is we have effects that we don't like at all. This person is dying of this disease. This person is suffering from this malady. We have an effect. Right? And then we study to figure out the causes of it. Good. Fantastic. I love it. Right? 
But if we're in the part of the world where things can be other than they are, what is the methodology, the most rigorous methodology in the world laid out by the greatest scientist who has ever lived? And that is this. This is what his prescription was, Aristotle's prescription was. In this part of the world, you must imagine possibilities and choose the one for which the most compelling argument can be made. Choose the one for which the most compelling argument can be made. This makes innovation a profoundly social process. So lots of people complain about innovation. I got a great idea for something new and nobody believed it. Aristotle would say, yeah, chump. I mean, you only did the first half. You imagined the possibility. You didn't engage the people who would have to utilize that possibility in a dialogue that would help determine for the people this new possibility would influence, what is the most compelling uh, argument? And so the best, the most effective innovators, I believe, are the ones that can make the most compelling arguments. And they, you cannot make such a compelling argument utilizing data in a scientific fashion. Right? Using data in a scientific fashion can only buttress the notion that we are looking at part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. That's it. That is the only use of data. We use it for everything. Let me emphasize, we use it for everything and it has only one actual utility. Does that mean that there are no data points involved in the part of the world where things cannot be, uh, can, things can be other than they are. No, it's just not scientific data. Right? We all love Johnny Ive, right? Brilliant Apple designer, probably the best, most influential in-house uh, designer uh, on the face of the planet. Um, people give, it, give Steve Jobs the credit for the iMac. That was the first big product launch after uh, Steve Jobs came back to uh, Apple. Uh, Steve Jobs had nothing to do with the conception or design of the iMac. The iMac was completely ready to be launched and had been for some time by the time that Steve Jobs got back. Steve Jobs did a wonderful thing, right? which is the minute, apparently, as the urban legend goes, the minute he visited, went and visited Johnny Ives and said, what'd you got? Because he knew he needed to fix stuff. He saw the IMAX sitting there and just said, boom, we're launching. That was, that was the amount of analysis that Steve Jobs did for that, apparently. Um, well, where did those, those five colored, those lime greens and tangerines and grape, you know, where did that come from? Well, it was, Johnny Ives imagining a possibility, but it did it come from nowhere. Right? No, it didn't. It did not come from nowhere. Johnny Ives remembered growing up when the Imperial Camera Company launched a line of cameras that were in five bright colors because they believed that they could break the hegemony of black and dark brown and dark gray cameras and consumers would like them. And guess what the five colors were? The exact five that, uh, that Johnny Ives uh, decades later used. So you imagine possibilities based on your interpretation of a world that's a complicated world, but you don't insist on crunching them scientifically because if he tried to find a statistically significant sample of times when somebody uh, decided to use color instead of black and white in, an, in a, a consumer product, he would have found a couple and he would have been dismissed as being unscientific. So this is the task. The task is to utilize both analytic posteriori and rhetoric, the works of the world's greatest scientist, and not use one and ignore his advice. It is hypocritical, 
to ignore his advice while using it. Thank you very much.